They have it right in front of you in the book on uh, your cell phone. So, so that's you can read it. But by the end of the week, it should be memorized. Ready? 400 years, 1619 to 2019, the ethics of reparation and reconciliation. Amen. You know, every, that's the pastor's preacher coming over there, amen. But every, in you know, staff meetings, from the time we developed the idea, we made sure that it was announced. So in preparation for this moment, we believe that we don't really die, but we just change form and continue. Ancestral bodies and spirits and divinities continues to look over us and engage us and remind us that we are part of a larger conversation. We are not just a piece of a pie that's disconnected with part of a lot of conversation. We're continuing this conversation this morning with our student moderator is Cameron Grant. She comes from Texas. And, and uh, last year she came to, I'm, I'm going to tell you the difference, and she came to me. I want to we did this in our, in our honors program. We have so many 4.0s. And that, that is so strange to me when I said, well, what's the GPA? It's a 4.0. In what? Well, in chemist, chemical engineering or something. And I can't even pronounce some of the words. <laughs> and they just dropped the 4.0. Because when I was in college, I didn't see that 4.0. I heard about it. <laughs> They said they existed somewhere, but I, I, I didn't see it. So I hear it so often now. I'm, I'm getting a little, uh, a little uh, sanitized. This is that's how they they just see themselves. So it's no big deal for them. So in the honors program, we try to pull out some other pieces of balance, right? Not just the heady stuff, but also the participation in all parts of the functions of community engagement. So. So uh, I met Cameron one night, and she said that uh, she said that she may have to leave Tuskegee University and go to some school in Texas. I don't remember the name of the school in Texas. Neither do I care. <laughs> it could be the University of Houston. I didn't care. And I said, you know what? Uh, when the, when you came here, you said, didn't you, that this is where the Lord wanted you to be? Well, yes. I said, well, we need to have a conversation with God right there in the lobby. So let us pray. Let's have a conversation. And um, she's still here. Oh, she is absolutely so sick. We are so proud of her. She is one of our um, best young scholars. So Karen Gatt will now come and be our moderator and introduce to us our first presenter. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you so much, Dr. Hodge, for that warm welcome. Um, today, I'm so privileged to serve as the moderator for the session today, and the title is The Ethics of Slavery by Another Name. And today, our keynote speaker is Dr. Douglas A. Blackman. He was born in Stuttgart, Arkansas, and raised in the Mississippi Delta. He got his start in journalism after writing a story for the Leland, Mississippi Progress, his hometown weekly, when he was just 12 years old. He is currently a professor of practice at Georgia State University and a lead faculty member in the Narrating Justice Project, an initiative to support students and faculty in producing powerful nonfiction narratives around issues of social justice on every media platform. Among his current projects are Pursuing Justice with co-author former U.S. Attorney General Eric H. Holder, Jr., examining the current crisis in the American justice system and The Harvest, a two-hour documentary for PBS exploring the consequences of failed public school integration in the U.S. Blackman first worked as a reporter for the Arkansas Democrat in 1985 through 1987. He became co-owner and managing editor of The Daily Record in Little Rock, Arkansas from 1987 to 1989. Blackman led the journal's distinguished coverage of major national stories, including the failed government response to Hurricane Katrina, the 9-11 hijackers, emergence of the Tea Party, and coverage of the economy and politics of the South. 
And also we have the respondent, Dr. Victor Kirksey, MPH, is currently a PhD candidate at the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina, studying health services policy and management. Prior to attending the University of South Carolina, Mr. Kirksey attended Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama, and Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, where he earned his bachelor's degree in health administration and master of public health degree. Mr. Kirksey's interest is in improving the access to and utilization of quality healthcare services for socially disadvantaged populations in urban and rural environments. Mr. Kirksey's professional and research goal is to synthesize and discern the evidence that will support local, state, and national health policy to improve health and health services for all, regardless of their social distinction. Thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing from both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's, uh, thanks for the very kind introduction. It's good to be with all of you. Good to be back at Tuskegee. Uh, uh, it, I was last here uh, just to look around because I happened to be nearby while I was doing research for the book that I'll be talking about uh, today. Uh, and I, but I, some of the most terrible scenes in the book actually occurred not very far from here. Uh, in Tallapoosa County, uh, a lot of the book describes uh, some, some terrible events that occurred there at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and so uh, uh, I was here, I, I, I dropped by back then, I didn't have a chance really to talk to anybody or encounter any students, so uh, as faculty, so I'm glad to be able to, uh, to be back today. Uh, so uh, I want to be mindful of the time that we all have, uh, and so I'm going to try to tell you as much as I can, but not, uh, uh, but but not um, uh, take more time than, uh, than has been allotted to me. I'm going to put this out here so I can try to keep up with that. But you all stop me too if I get out of control. Um, but uh, I'm, in terms of the theme of the conference, the, uh, I'm, your, uh, I'm going to provide you with even more things to be frustrated about than you already have. Uh, now, if you read my book or you're familiar with the contents of it, uh, then you, uh, or the readings that I think were distributed, then you already have some idea of that. Uh, but, uh, but I'm the messenger of that, as bad as most people may recognize what was done to African Americans in the rural deep south in the early years of the 20th century, however bad uh, most people perceive that to have been, it was in fact much, much worse. Uh, that the, the world that existed uh, for the grandparents and great-grandparents of, of many people in the room here all across the South, not just in Alabama, but certainly Alabama and Georgia as an epicenter of, of much of this, of these terrible things that happened, and how much worse they really were. Uh, and, but I, uh, and sometimes people uh, think that, that I'm a sort of, uh, uh, I mean, some of this is almost like being a scholar of Satanism. Uh, some of it is so terrible. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but the it, but it's not the sort of sensational dimensions of some of the things that were so terrible. It's that I think that is absolutely fundamental to our understanding of society as it exists today to actually recognize that things much 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 more impactful than uh, than the obvious surface of an apartheid regime and uh, the uh, indignities that people were subjected to and. Uh, too often, all of this entire story is oversimplified into the black people were called a bad name and not allowed to vote and had to go to separate schools. And those are terrible things. But for anybody to imagine that that's the sum total uh, of, of what happened, as opposed to the idea that I'll present, uh, which is that, that in fact slavery didn't end uh, uh, with, uh, with the end of the Civil War, the passage of the 13th Amendment. It was interrupted. Uh, but that slavery was resurrected, something very similar to the slavery that existed before the Civil War, and slavery really was extended deep into the 20th century in ways that, uh, that had a, a tremendous impact on the lives of millions of people who experienced it directly, uh, or, or, or whose lives were affected by it directly, and then by even more millions of people who descended from, uh, from them, and that we still feel the repercussions of those structural dimensions of our society today. One of the things that I often, when I get into conversations with people about 
terms like structural racism. Uh, one of the things that I would say is that uh, you see many people that there, there are many well-intentioned people who will tell you who will say that uh, that uh, racial bias is wrong, discrimination is wrong, and they, and they uh, would want to never. Uh, do anything like that themselves or see it happen in a workplace that they're in today, but then they have problems though with the idea that there are sort of invisible legacies of, of the things that happened in the past or sort of baked in responses in our economic system and our social system that continue to affect the outcomes of uh, people's lives in society today, which is really what structural racism is. But and in those conversations, I oftentimes end up saying that, look, it, it, it oversimplifies it a little bit, perhaps, but, it's, but it basically boils down to that one either accepts that in our economic system there are mechanical uh, formulas and mechanical events and uh, that there, there are structural dimensions of the society that we live in that are the primary explanation for the economic and educational disparities between African Americans and, and white Americans, either there are structural structural elements to our society that cause those persistent disparities to, to continue to exist, one either accepts that or you're a white supremacist. It is, you, you either, you, because there are, there's no other possible explanation really. Uh, uh, if you think that you, if you don't believe that our society is, is built to have these outcomes, maybe not as consciously as it once did, but if you don't believe that those things are baked into the society, then the only other explanation for the persistent gap uh, in wealth and so many other things uh, is that you imagine there's some profound difference between black people and white people, and of course there's not. Um, but so, uh, what I'll be talking about today are things that relate to these terrible things that happened in the past. Before I go into some of that though, I should probably uh, reckon with the thing uh, the dilemma that every author since Moses has had to confront, uh, and that is that some of you have not yet finished reading my book, uh, and so I should probably give you a, uh, a little bit of a summary of uh, what it's about. But, but the title is Slavery by Another Name, The Re-Enslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II. Uh, there's also a film, a uh, PBS documentary film that aired a few years ago and frequently rebroadcast by the same name. But the book tells the story of what I was describing just a minute ago, of how in the decades after the Civil War, after a period during which uh, African Americans, the, the four million formerly enslaved African Americans who lived in the South, and of course that's the overwhelming black population of America, uh, are, are formerly enslaved people in the counties where, in the places in the South where they had been enslaved, and African Americans remain overwhelmingly in those places for many decades, uh, all the way up to the very beginning of the 20th century. Uh, there, there's been very little movement uh, of people out of the, the slave counties of the South. Uh, and so the, the, but those four million people who had been enslaved, immediately after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction period, and I, I don't know if anybody's watched the uh, uh, Skip Gates' new documentary on Reconstruction that, uh, that explores some of this territory as well. Uh, but, but those African Americans who were alive at the, at the end of the, the slavery that we're more familiar with did experience a period of authentic freedom and authentic citizenship immediately after the Civil War. It was still a time of great duress and a time when African Americans were confronted with the hostilities uh, of whites who were angry about the outcome of the war and angry about the way that the economic system had been, uh, had, had been turned on its head. Uh, and there were, from the very beginning, there were people who were challenging the, uh, whether African Americans would really be able to exercise the legal and civil rights that, that had been awarded to them. Uh, but even in the midst of all of that duress and hunger and deprivation and difficulty, it was nonetheless a period of time in which huge numbers uh, of African American men, because only men could vote in, at that time, of course, uh, but African American men participated in elections. African Americans swarmed into the new public schools that were uh, made available to them in the South. The literacy rates of African Americans uh, raced. It's actually a, a, a miraculous kind of thing when you look at the at the numbers, at the 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 the, the, the speed with which uh, the educational levels of African Americans changed to the point that, uh, that the literacy abilities of 
African Americans and the and sort of economically similar white families like the people that I descend from were about the same by 1900. You know, the, the sort of uh, four people in the countryside literacy rates uh, um, began to look very similar by the end of the of, of the 1800s. But in this early period of time, right after the Civil War, there is this period of difficult but authentic freedom and citizenship, uh, and then all of that changes uh, through a variety of means, but primarily through a perversion of the criminal justice system, does that sound a little familiar? Uh, but through this perversion of the criminal justice system, uh, a what I call neo-slavery, but a, a new threat is developed that hangs over the heads of, of every African-American man in the rural South, uh, and asks that, that the possibility of being arrested for some crime, uh, oftentimes a crime that didn't really exist or hadn't actually occurred, but under a whole battery of laws that came to be passed uh, in almost every southern state that effectively criminalized African-American life, where the intention of these laws was to, to make it almost impossible that a black man was not in violation of some law at almost all times. Uh, so that it became illegal in, in pretty much every southern state for things that, laws that were, that are a bit hard to understand even today, to sort of you know, understand what they were even targeting, but it was a crime all over the South uh, for, to walk beside a railroad line. You know, so if you, were, if you were walking beside a railroad line, you could be arrested uh, at, at any time. Now, what, what's that actually about? Well, you know, what it's about is that in a time when there really weren't any roads, you know, if you, if you, if you could go back to Tuskegee in 1901, the difficulty of getting from here to Montgomery or from here to any other town on the roads as they existed then was incredibly complicated. <laughs> Uh, and so what poor people did is they walked along railroad lines. Uh, and so, the, because those were the best, in fact, those were called roads. Uh, and, the, uh, and so to have a law that made it very clear that if you're walking on the right side of the railroad that you can be arrested, that statute didn't say that it only applied to black people, but it was a statute that was ever, only ever going to be enforced against poor people because that's who's walking along, along the railroads. And in fact, it was only ever going to be enforced against black people. But it was a crime to... Uh, to speak loudly in the company of white women, quote unquote, to speak loudly in the company of white women, black men could be arrested for that. It was a crime, obviously, to have any sort of uh, romantic relationship across racial lines. Uh, the uh, it was also there were also statutes on the book on the books uh, that made it a crime to commit adultery or uh, other kinds of moral moral crimes. There were statutes at the time, but those crimes, if you go. If you go carefully through the arrest records and the court records of the South, you find that those, those uh, morality laws were overwhelmingly applied uh, exclusively to African Americans. Uh, the, the, uh, it was a crime to sell the produce of your farm after dark. And of course, you know, almost every African American, vast majority, not almost every, but the vast majority of African Americans still lived on farms, worked on farms, all the way up to the first years of the 20th century. Uh, and so it was a, but it was a crime to sell the produce of your farm after dark. And again, why would you know what, what what's that even about? You know, well, what that's about uh, is that a, a fear that African Americans would have some sort of economic independence if they were able to sell the produce of their of their work to somebody other than the designated powerful person in their county who's supposed to be the person. Uh, that buys the produce of every farm and then makes money uh, in the reselling of it. And so you make it a crime uh, to engage to, to, to engage in any other kind of business such as that it might require you to, uh, to leave your farm or even to do things under the color of darkness. But the most pernicious of these laws were the vagrancy statutes and, and one other. Uh, so that it was, a, it was a crime everywhere in the South by the beginning of the 20th century to be unemployed. Now there have been vagrancy statutes on the books um, uh, from the beginning of the American colonies and vagrancy statutes go back to medieval law in, in England and Europe. Uh, and so it's not a particular surprise that such a statute would exist. But what happened in the South in, in this period was that those old statutes, almost forgotten dimensions uh, of the criminal codes were resurrected in this period of time because of how powerfully they could be used against African-American men. And so it became a crime, and an African-American man was vulnerable to arrest and punishment if at any time he could not establish that he had a job. Now, in an era in which nobody had pay stubs and, and people worked by the day from, 
from when he got up to, to, to when the sun went down, the only, there were only two ways to prove that you were employed. One was either to, to pull the money out of your pocket that proved you had just been paid, or to have some white person, or some established white figure, uh, to say that he employed you, that, that, to, to, in effect, live under, in some fashion, the protection of some powerful white person, which in and of itself uh, demanded a compromise uh, on the part of an independent African American man. Um, and so the, and if you didn't have some ability to do that, or, or if you, and, and of course, not every single African American person found themselves in that dilemma. People did have some greater degree of economic success, had more autonomy, it could, could evade some of these things. But if you were a poor African American, an economically poor African American man out in the countryside, uh, working as a laborer on land owned by someone else, you were in a position of incredible vulnerability. And there were hundreds of thousands of black men who were arrested under the vagrancy statute uh, purely on uh, purely on the specious uh, basis uh, and specifically designed to pull them into what was ultimately uh, an exploitation of their labor, not an enforcement of a meaningful criminal statute. But so it was a crime not to be employed, but it was also, and Alabama pioneered this and stuck to this particular statute more aggressively and longer than almost any other place in the South, but it was also a crime for a farm laborer, again, almost all African American men fell in that category, um, but it was a crime for a farm worker to enter into a contract with a landowner uh, to work for a season, and there are probably some people in the room old enough to, 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 know, to have some familiarity with how these old systems worked, and it was similar to sharecropping, uh, but, but, but not exactly the same. But, uh, but if you entered, if you signed a contract with a landowner to say, okay, I'll work on your place for this season, I'll probably live in this house on your property uh, for this season, and uh, we'll have that arrangement uh, over the course of this season, and I'll, wor I'll work until the end, I'll work till Christmas, you know, from spring until Christmas, uh, and then when the crop is in and everything is settled, that'll be the end of our contract, and maybe we'll sign another one for the next year. Well, that was the typical arrangement for hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of, of African-American families uh, in, the, in the first 50 years after the Civil War. Well, in Alabama, and eventually almost every southern state, if you entered into a contract like that, uh, but then at some point along the way, in the course of the season, if you decided that you could get a better arrangement than somebody else down the road, or if a white man came to your farm, farm you were working, and said, hey, you know, your family looks kind of ragged over there, you, you know, or, or you don't get enough food, or if you were being whipped in the field. And, and uh, something that we have almost completely lost is that up until the first years of the 20th century, the latch was still a ubiquitous element of the Southern landscape. W.E. Du Bois writes in <clears> The <throat> Souls of Black Folk, which came out in 1903, he describes this trip that he took across Georgia from Atlanta down to the coast, and he calls Georgia the New Egypt. That's the name of the chapter where he talks about this. And he describes, as he travels across the countryside, that everywhere he went, every direction he looked, he saw lines of black men chained together in the fields, being lashed by white overseers. You know, this scene that was so reminiscent of antebellum slavery, and in many respects much worse than the, than the typical conditions of antebellum slavery. But so if you sign into one of these contracts, and you're being whipped in the field every day. Your family is being starved. And the other thing that's unpleasant to talk about, but a harsh reality of this time, if your wife or your daughter is being sexually exploited by the white landowner, which is another incredibly common dimension of that period of time, the, uh, but those things are happening to you. And then somebody comes along and says, look, why don't you move over to my place, and I'll treat you better, and I'll give you a better deal. And if you say yes to that, you committed a crime. It was a crime. Uh, it's called the false pretense statute. Now, the, if you and I, if any of us, if we decide, if we make some business arrangement together, if I agree to work for you for a year uh, on some projects now, or if, if I sold you a used car that I had, and we agreed that, that you were going to pay me a certain amount of money every month to, to buy that car, uh, and then somehow down the road, uh, our business agreement didn't work out, and I, st I stopped working for you at some point, or you stopped paying me for the car that you bought. 
we would we might get in an argument about that. Uh, we might go down to the courthouse and you know one of us might sue the other one in small claims court to sort out this disagreement that we had. Uh, we could end up in a conflict about that even today. But those would be civil disputes. Uh, and at the most that would happen would be that a judge might say, well, all right, Doug, you got to pay this person this amount of money or they've got to pay you this for the car and they've got to give the car back to you. But there would be no possibility that he, either of us would ever end up going to jail over these business, this business dispute that we'd had. But, and that's exactly what these kinds of arrangements were between these landowners uh, and African-American men in that period of time. But back then, uh, the, what those laws did was that they made those business relationships and the violations of those contracts into criminal offenses. And so if you were working for this incredibly abusive uh, landowner and then left his employment without written permission, that's what the statute said, you have to have written permission from the landowner. If you left that farm without permission and went to another farm, it's not just that he could come after you and argue that you needed to finish out your contract, he would contact the sheriff and the sheriff would go and arrest this man under the false pretense statute and there would be a high probability that he would end up back at the same farm but now as a convict laborer now in chains working for the very same man but now not being paid for it uh, and his family in an even uh, greater state of desperation well those those kinds of arrests and offenses and the sort of catastrophic consequences of that on african-american families those things happen to tens of thousands of people uh, which was something that was almost absent from our understanding of that history. But so, in the South, it, be, it came to be the case that it was a crime to be unemployed, and in many cases, it was a crime to seek employment. And that was exactly the catch-22 uh, that, that comes to pass when you have a legal system that has been reconfigured for a purpose other than justice. And that's exactly what had occurred in the South. The criminal justice system, as it existed at that time, was something about justice as it related to white people, but as it related to African Americans, one of its primary purposes was to, to create legal jeopardy for almost all African American men, to then draw into the criminal justice system armies of people who then, unable to pay fines that were imposed on them, uh, uh, would agree to enter into labor contracts, with where white people, white landowners are powerful, uh, white political players are industrial interests owned by, uh, by white capitalists, uh, that those people would pay the fines of African American men who had been arrested and in exchange, they would be treated as convict laborers, prison laborers uh, for periods of time that are just unfathomable. Uh, the penalties for uh, something like vagrancy in 1901 or 1905, a judge might sentence a person to a dollar or five dollars for the as the penalty for being convicted of vagrancy. But they would also attach to that penalty fees that were paid to the court. And of course, you pay court fees today, which are increasingly abusive. There's a real there's a mirror image actually of some of this. Uh, but they would be in addition to this fine of a dollar or five dollars, they would be charged fees. Uh, to the courts. You'd have to pay a fee to a witness who testified against you. You had to pay a fee to the deputy sheriff who came out and picked you up. You had to pay a fee to the sheriff. You essentially had to pay every person who had had any part of your arrest, however justified or unjustified the arrest might be. And so those fees would quickly add up and very typically to $150 or $200 or maybe even $300 for this vagrancy arrest. Well, this is at a time when the average, the average annual compensation of a farm labor, of an African American farm labor in the rural South, is probably about $100 a year, if that. Many people's annual income might have been $75 or $80 a year. And so you've been arrested and convicted under one of these in completely trumped up statutes that involves no crime whatsoever, and the penalty for that uh, is, is three or four years of, of what your entire economic capacity might be. So it's, it's the parallel, really, of that if, if this afternoon when I'm driving back to Atlanta, if I get pulled over for a, uh, and get a speeding ticket from a state trooper somewhere, and the fine for that ticket is 
You know, that's the equivalent uh, situation. And if I can't pay that $50,000, then my only alternative is to become a convict laborer for three or four years. You know, that's the situation, the, 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 the equivalent situation. And this happened to thousands and thousands and thousands of African Americans. The, on top of all that, the, we don't know historically exactly how many people this occurred to because the records are not as good as you know, what, what survives and the records is not as good as, as what we would hope. But we know a lot more about it than historians thought for a long time. There was sort of this assumption by most historians that the, that the criminal justice system you know, was highly problematic as it related to black people in this period of time, but there was also an assumption that there was really no way to get to the bottom of all this. Uh, and you know, how could we go back and, and uh, figure out whether uh, all of these people charged with vagrancy, which is the same thing that today, uh, if the police are ticketing a homeless person to try to get them to get out of the downtown area of, a, of some city before a big, a big event is going to occur, that, that they get ticketed for vagrancy today too. Uh, but, the, but so the historian's view typically was that how exactly can we figure out what really was going on with all these vagrancy charges or all these false pretense charges. Um, and so there was, there was kind of a, an acceptance that the system was bad, but uh, an unwillingness uh, to, to believe either that we could really understand uh, how bad it was, um, and then to the degree that we did understand how bad it was, there was a lot of resistance among even very fine historians to the extreme brutality of the system. Uh, because it is, even for, uh, for very fine scholars, it can be difficult uh, to come to grips with just how bad things were uh, in this period of time. And so when I started into this project, by kind of a circuitous uh, process, uh, I didn't realize quite what I was getting into. I started off uh, where I was looking at one place in Alabama where there was one coal mine that at the beginning of the 20th century, it appeared that maybe the 1,000 prison laborers in this coal mine were not really prisoners. Maybe some of them hadn't even been convicted of a crime. Maybe some of them had just been kidnapped and sold into this place. And so that, that was my starting point uh, on this whole project. And then it grew and grew on me, and I ended up spending most of a decade uh, digging into trying to understand what had happened and the scale of what had happened. And one of the things that I finally did was I realized that, that I really was looking at the equivalent of parking tickets. Um, and, uh, and while there was this assumption that, well, there's no way that the paperwork uh, related to all of these tiny, minor uh, uh, cases there's no way that the record of that would still survive. Uh, and so most people had not really tried to find whether that record had survived. Uh, but partly because of my own experience as a journalist, uh, I, I had some understanding of how strangely difficult it is for some things to disappear. And, uh, and government documents are one of those things that uh, tend to just stay around for a long time. Partly because people forget what they're for, what they're about. Uh, and so they're afraid to throw them away uh, even when they can. Um, and so, and also because it's hard work. Uh, you know, if you've got, a, if, uh, if you're working in a courthouse somewhere in, the, in Alabama or Georgia, and uh, it's an old courthouse and it has the old county jail on the top floor, which was a common feature of a lot of, a lot of jails built in the early 20th century. And very often it'd be the case uh, that the jail would have ended up, the old jail, not in use anymore, would end up being packed full of all of the old documents that nobody understood the purpose of anymore. And so even if you thought, well, I don't know what all that stuff is and we ought to get rid of it, the, just the physical task of getting rid of it was a difficult thing. And that tended to make, as long as the building stood, things tended to survive. And so I started going from courthouse to courthouse, first just in Alabama, and then in Georgia, and some in Mississippi and Florida, just sort of working my way across the places where there seemed to be some likelihood that this whole system would have flourished. Uh, and I would just go into a courthouse and start asking about, uh, about these old records. And invariably, uh, when I went to the county clerk's desk, 
the first response from the middle-aged white lady who was always sitting there, and, uh, and, it, and it was usually the same middle-aged white lady who'd been at the previous courthouse, too. Sometimes you'd always get there just before me. But, uh, uh, but I would walk in and I'd start asking about these, these old court records, and the first answer would always be, oh no, that's all, that's all gone. And these, and these would be truthful responses. These would be what people believed to be the truth, <clears throat> what they had been told by by her mother, when her mother was the county clerk. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and so they would say, well, no, there were, no, none of that exists anymore. You know, there was nothing in this courthouse earlier than, and they would say some of your. Um, and so, and then oftentimes, they, another thing, would probably one out of 10, their first response would be, oh, the courthouse burned a long time ago. And everything got burned up with it, you know, because that was the answer that had been given to almost everybody who asked a hard question for a really long time. People believed it. So I started making a habit of, <clears throat> if it was an old courthouse, I was made a habit of before I walked in, I would try to find the cornerstone of the building so I would know what year it was built. Uh, and, then, and then when they said, well, the courthouse burns, you know, back in the 30s, uh, and then we said, well, is that this courthouse? Well, you know, and of course, you know, buildings can be rebuilt. But, but anything that interrupted the script, you know, when I would say, well, I, I thought this building was built in 1902, uh, then would would interrupt the, this automatic response and make somebody stop and actually try to answer the question. It also would suggest to them that I knew something uh, and that, or that I was from the area somehow. So I had to be treated, I should be treated a little bit differently. And, uh, and so next thing you know, uh, um, I would begin to find my way into some of these troves of records. Uh, I even, this part's gonna sound like a lie, uh, but it's not. The, I, I even began to, some of these places where I walk into an old courthouse that just had all the, I, I got pretty good at identifying where there were going to be some records that survived. And I walk into one of those places and get uh, this total blank face response uh, from somebody. And then I would just, on a total gamble, I would say, you know, but don't you remember, you know, some other place <laughs> again, don't you remember, uh, you know, Several years ago, the the and then I just make something up and say you know, the, the you know remember the coach at the high school brought this, it was the senior service day and they came over and, and they were cleaning out the basement you know and there were all these big leather you know volumes and they hauled them out don't you remember that um, uh, and you know half the time they look at me like I was crazy you know because you know I was just making it up uh, but the other half of the time they would say oh. <laughs> and they would say, well, no, look, it wasn't the, high, not the senior day, you know, it was the, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was the, the cheerleaders or something, you know. I said, oh, well, that's what it was, you know. And they said, well, where did they put all that? Oh, it's in the old county health department building. Who's got the key? Well, my mom does. You know, so. <laughs> Can you call her, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and next thing you know, I walked into a room as big as this, you know, that was just full of all this stuff that nobody knew where it was. Um, and, uh, and so then I would sit down and start just plowing through it. Uh, and I, I had to learn the old, you know, I had to learn the 19th century legal filing system, and you know, I had to, had to learn how the courts worked in that time, you know, these are very different systems and all that. But I, but I began, though, to find, in some, in some places everything was gone, in some places the courthouse did burn down. Uh, and, in, and in places that had been prosperous, uh, they, they were a lot more likely to have put in a computer system you know, when computers first came along. And so they might have thrown away the old stuff to make room for the computers. I mean, there were situations where things had disappeared. But, but particularly out in, in, in rural counties that had been very prosperous at the beginning of the 20th century when the price of cotton was high and the bowl people hadn't arrived yet. Uh, <laughs> old folks will know what I'm talking about on that. Uh, but places like that, that, that were rich in 1910, uh, and built a state-of-the-art courthouse, and then everything collapsed, and they didn't have the money to ever build a new courthouse again, and they didn't put in computers until you know the 2000s. Places like that were the ones where I would sometimes find just these incredible uh, time capsules of information. And I would sit down and spend days and days or weeks digging through that stuff. And what, what began to appear from all of that was a system of forced labor created by the court system that was absolutely enormous. 
I mean, I went through, you know, I laid my eyes on, put my finger on, literally millions of entries in these record books that were kept at the time. Uh, and the thousands and thousands and thousands of African American men who were arrested, and some African American women, but overwhelmingly just men, who were arrested under these statutes that were overtly racial in their intention uh, and overwhelmingly targeted only at African Americans. There were just tens of thousands of them, tens of thousands of them just in Alabama, tens of thousands of them in, uh, in, uh, in courthouses in North Florida. Um, and in all of these things, these, these things only occurred on a large scale where there were lots of black people. You know, there, you go to, some, go to some white county in North Alabama where there really weren't any black people, poor whites were not being subjected to the same laws, the same abuse of treatment, even though those laws were on the books, you know, they, they could have been. This was only happening where black people were, uh, and it was only happening in places where there were certain industries that lent themselves to this exploitation of labor. Uh, and so in, the, in places where farmers needed huge numbers of people to chop cotton in the spring and pick cotton in the fall, then these systems were heavily in use. Uh, around Birmingham and in places where you had coal mines and, and uh, sort of crude industrial uh, business operations where in that era, it was a, 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 almost anyone, any, any strong person could be put in a coal mine and be made into a productive worker with a pickaxe in a short period of time. Well, in those places, uh, then these, these systems were put into place. And so thousands and thousands and thousands of African American men were forced into the coal mines around Birmingham as forced laborers who got no compensation. And in the vast majority of cases, on the basis of these kinds of, of uh, specious uh, criminal offenses and trumped up charges. And so as I began to work through all this material in all of these different places, I began to realize that, you know, this isn't just a story of some anomaly. You know, this wasn't about that there was some bad coal, coal mine somewhere or one bad sheriff somewhere. This was a system of enslavement uh, that had, had directly ensnared hundreds of thousands, and I would venture probably uh, at least a million men uh, directly into, into to this treatment, but it also became this incredible threat that hung over the lives of everybody else. And so one of the, when sometimes young, younger African Americans will say to me when they're feeling a little more uh, uh, comfortable, They'll, they'll start asking, you know, I don't understand why my grandparents and my great-grandparents, you know, why did they go along with whatever happened? You know, I'll get that question. You know, why didn't they rise up against, you know, against the white people who were doing these things? Or, you know, why didn't they fight back? You know, this is, and the, it's a natural young person's question and also a, a you know, a, a gross misunderstanding of the situation. But part of the answer uh, is that it wasn't as simple as that there was this, this cruel white person on whose land this one family works. It was this entire system of oppression and the penalty. We, we focus on lynchings and mob violence. That's the, that's the part of the story that we understand the best. And that was the ultimate penalty for resisting the system. But the next closest to the ultimate penalty was that if you broke with these social conventions that were being demanded by whites, uh, that this threat of being re-enslaved hung over the head of almost every African-American man, and it would be deployed through the criminal justice system. And so whites, both in business and whites in politics, also began to realize that this was an incredibly effective technique for accomplishing two purposes, to the, which were their primary goals at that time. And those two purposes were to recreate an economic system in which huge numbers of African-Americans were available to work at subsistence or less than subsistence cost for white people, essentially go back to the, the, the most valuable parts of the slavery-based economic system. Uh, but how do we get back to a way that we've got millions of African-Americans available to, uh, to our economic interests at almost no cost? That was goal number one. This was a very effective way of, of pushing toward that. And the second was that it was an incredibly effective means for terrorizing uh, African-Americans away from political aspirations. And so it happened over and over and over again. It's, it's hard to find these exact incidents because it's hard to, it's hard to figure out who the, who the politically active 
African American, most likely Republican man was in Greene County, Alabama in 1902. You know, there's not, there's, there's, there's no book to go to, just look up who was that man, who was that person. But to the degree that you can identify those people uh, who were trying to be politically active and trying to be political leaders in this period of incredible duress, what you also find over and over again, miraculously, was that these local political leaders seem to get in a lot of trouble with the law. Uh, and oftentimes under these very, very dubious uh, and oftentimes obviously bogus uh, 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 situations. And certainly, if it ever happened that a group of white men went to the home of a politically active black man and there ended up being violence and somebody, and somebody ended up being killed before the, the situation was over, and, uh, then it would be the African-American men involved in that who would be arrested and charged with murder, who would end up going to jail or end up in a coal mine in Alabama, uh, in, in, in the outside of Birmingham. And so the, so it was an incredibly effective system for terrorizing African-Americans, repressing political aspirations at a time that, that there was a great deal of optimism on the part of African-Americans about being legitimate players in the political system, and it was a hugely effective way of, uh, of restoring an economic system that was based on uh, a, a forced labor model, a surf labor model. And so that's what the, that, that, that's the story that the book tells. Um, and uh, I think I am approaching the, 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 the time that I should take. But, uh, but before I finish, I just, I'll, uh, I'll mention a few specific things. Uh, one is that, you know, we just arrived, we just had the, this past week uh, was the anniversary I guess the 108th anniversary of the, the Banner Mine explosion. Who remember, who's heard reference to the Banner Mine? Some of the old folks in the room might. But the, the, the Banner Mine was a mine, coal mine outside of Birmingham that uh, had a huge industrial explosion in April of 1911. Uh, and there were, uh, in the end, about 150 men were killed uh, in that explosion. and. Uh, uh, about 15 or 20 of them were white, the rest were black. All of the black men were convict laborers who had been arrested and, and forced into that mine under, these, under the circumstances I've just described. Uh, and, the, and most of them, after the explosion, were, their bodies were dumped in a big trench just outside the mouth of the mine and just covered up. Uh, and then within two weeks, the mine was back in operation. Uh, it was a classic story of, of uh, the negligence of, a, of the way that the place had been designed and operated and worked around the clock. Um, and the, but these, the, the coal mines around Birmingham were the, the you know, sometimes, and I'm from Mississippi, so I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to people who sometimes want to say, you know, why does somebody have to talk bad about my home state again? Uh, you know, you know, and all, you know, all of us have had some version of that experience. And uh, I know Alabama feels that way a lot. Uh, and the uh, and sometimes I, some somebody from home will say that to me, and I'll say, well, because we deserve to be talked about that way in Mississippi, <laughs> and uh, and you know Alabama has some of that too. Uh, but the but those things are not necessarily about some unique moral failure of a particular place. You know, the reason that a particular uh, particularly long list of bad things happen in one place like Alabama. Oftentimes, at least by, by my view, it happens because, the, for instance, the incredible violence and brutality of this system I'm describing uh, would reach its zenith in a place like a coal mine, like a slave coal mine. And Alabama had a lot of these coal mines at the period of time that these things were happening. And so it had an incredibly exaggerated, terrible story in that particular period of time. And the, but it was really terrible. Uh, and let me just very briefly uh, describe some of that to you, particularly since there's a public health dimension to some of this. But the, the, the work camps that these men were forced into, or the coal mines, it was a very common occurrence that uh, if you ended up in one of these coal mines outside of Birmingham, that you worked uh, in some of these mines, the men were housed in these prison stockades where they were chained together uh, essentially 24 hours a day. 
They were chained into their bunks, you know, into their beds at night and chained to each other. And they're chained all day as they worked. And oftentimes with these mines, they entered the mine through a shaft, through an underground shaft that connected directly to the, to the compound where their, where, where their stockade uh, was built. And so they would get up at three or four o'clock in the morning to begin work. And they would go into the shaft that led to the mine, and they would work all day in the mine and until long after dark, and then they'd go back to the shaft and back to the compound. And they worked seven days a week. There was never, there was never any, uh, any, you know, any rest or cessation, you know, any of this. And so you would have that there would be men who working in some of these places who wouldn't see daylight for months at a time, you know, never see a ray of light for months at a time. The, the physical punishments in these places were based on the actual production. So every worker was assigned a task, a specific amount of coal that they had to extract from the coal mine every day. And the typical amounts for that would be four tons to six tons you know, that you individually had to remove from the mine every day. Uh, and if you didn't make task, then you'd be whipped at the end of the day. And these long lines of men would be lined up at the end of the day before they went back in the stockade and would be lashed 100 or 150 times for not making task. In many of these places, they'd be lashed again the next morning before they went back to work. If you saw the movie 12 Years a Slave, uh, there's a scene in that where uh, a group of enslaved people are in the barn at the end of, and they're tallying, tallying up how much cotton they've each picked over some period of time. Uh, and then the plantation owner orders that the people who've been underperforming by his measure then get brutally, brutally whipped. That's, the, that's one of the most accurate dimensions of that entire film. That's exactly how things work. It's the most grotesque and the most brutal are one of the most brutal scenes in the film, and that's exactly how the system worked in slavery, and that's how it worked in this system long after slavery was supposed to have ended. But so you had to make tasks. There was very little food. The way that, the, you know, amazingly, there was a case using the same law, the, the sheriff in Alabama just in the past year who had a big scandal of where he was, uh, he was collecting money that was from the state that was supposed to go to feeding prisoners in the county jail, but he was pocketing it and buying ski boats and things with it. Well, he did all that under a, a statute that, that, that relates back to all of this. And so the, if you got arrested in this county in 1902 uh, and you were taken to the county jail, the, the sheriff ran the jail, and typically his wife would make the food that would be served to the people in the jail. But the state would pay the sheriff a feeding fee, uh, a, a, a state-designated fee, like 25 cents a day, 35 cents a day. And that's the designated amount of money to feed the prisoners in the jail. But the way the system worked was that the sheriff just took that money, and if he could feed the prisoners for less than that, then that was fine too. Uh, and so the economic incentives to the sheriff were that, because he also got fees, uh, all these other fees every time he arrested somebody. So the economic incentive for every sheriff was to arrest as many people as possible and feed them as little as possible. And so these county jails became uh, 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 places of incredible deprivation, unbelievable starvation and hunger. And so then these men would go from the county jails into these work camps and these coal mines where they continued to, to be fed almost nothing. Um, it, there are many accounts of where someone was searching for a lost relative or they, you know, they, or they would stumble upon a, a work camp out in the middle of the woods somewhere where timber was being harvested and he'd walk into one of these camps, these remote camps, and the, again, this is it's sort of grotesque to even, even talk about this, but you'd walk into one of these camps and all of the men working there would be naked because they had worked until the, literally the clothes they were wearing had fallen off their bodies. Uh, and, uh, and, and you'd have a camp where there's 30 or 40 men out there with axes and chains together, uh, and they're naked and starving. You know, th these were scenes, scenes, scenes not dissimilar to what you know, Allied soldiers found when they arrived at German death camps in 1944, 1945. The, and so this was the, the, the scale of the, of the horror, really, that descended on the lives of, of so many people. And it generated vast amounts of money. In the first decades of the 20th century, 
the, the money that from this system, from the leasing of convicts, or this, and, and oftentimes the way it was written up in the records were that it was sales. They were talking about selling Negroes, that's how this was referred to. Uh, but, the, but the revenue from this system was the single largest source of income to the state of Alabama. It, got, it made more money off this than any other thing. It was the primary thing funding the operations of the state of Alabama, and, and many other southern states. But Alabama was, was, because the system was so prolific here, uh, was one of the worst. So I'll, I'll, I could go into lots of specific details about that, but I'm going to leave with just one last thing. And that is that in the, there was a brief little moment uh, in the, uh, in 1903, uh, after Teddy Roosevelt had become president, that uh, there was the well, Roosevelt came into office, and he was a he was a when he started as president, you know, anyway, he becomes president through, by accident, uh, if you if you know the story, uh, which is kind of funny because now he's a famous president, so uh, so uh, people love him, view him so romantically, you know now. But it's by accident that he became president, uh, and the way that it happened was that uh, you know he's a New York City figure. He's from upstate New York, uh, and his father came from a wealthy white family, obviously in New York. His mother came from a wealthy family in Georgia uh, that had owned slaves uh, before the Civil War, and so he had this sort of north-south thing going on uh, on both sides. And he viewed himself as somebody who was very open-minded and tolerant of everybody. And he had a real sense of social justice of the early 1900s style. He was a, he was a huge admirer of Booker T. Washington, and there was a famous incident where he invited Booker T. Washington to the White House, and, and Washington is the, becomes the first African American to be officially invited to go to the White House and have dinner with the president, and, uh, and, Rose, and Roosevelt does that, and, and Washington goes to the White House and has dinner with his family, including uh, and at the table, sitting at the table, is Roosevelt's daughter, Alice, who's a very, uh, uh, very, very attractive young woman and, uh, um, and an a, a elite person, a young person in Washington DC at the time. And when this happens, when Burgundy Washington sits at the same dinner table with this young, beautiful white woman and the president and the rest of his family, uh, newspapers and political leaders all over the South go berserk, uh, go absolutely berserk that this has occurred. Uh, one of the two senators from Mississippi makes a public pronouncement where he says, we will have to kill 10,000 of them to put them back in their place. Because Booker T. Washington had, had dinner at the White House. But the way that Roosevelt becomes president is that he's the, uh, in the 1890s, he, he becomes prominent in New York, ends up as the governor of New York. He's a Republican, very different kind of Republican Party uh, in those days. But he ends up as the governor of New York. But the Republican establishment in New York State hates him uh, because they're a business, all business oriented uh, group of people. And he is talking about working conditions in factories and, uh, and things that they're not interested in. And they also just don't like him. He's a loud mouth and he's a, sort of a braggart. And so when President McKinley is up for re-election in his second term, uh, and McKinley is the last president who had been an officer in the Civil War. So he, he's the end of a generation. Uh, and uh, so McKinley's up for re-election. Well, McKinley didn't like his vice president. I don't remember his name, his first vice president. So the folks in New York engineer it to have Teddy Roosevelt put on the ballot as the, to be the new vice president. And that works, and McKinley gets re-elected, and they've gotten rid of Teddy Roosevelt. And they think, in New York, that, you know, okay, we'll never hear from that guy again. You know, uh, and, and New York stays ours again. But so, uh, so Ted Roosevelt becomes president, uh, or becomes vice president, and then in 1901, what happens? Uh, uh, McKinley is assassinated, and uh, and so now Ted Roosevelt is president of the United States, and uh, and so he then, uh, uh, in the beginning, shows a good bit of racial moderation. I mean, things like inviting Booker T. Washington to the White House that was a big deal, and he asked uh, Washington to make a recommendation to him uh, of to to give him some names of of white men in Alabama uh, who could be nominated as a federal judge and who would oppose lynchings and who would be, but who would be Booker T. Washington's pick to be the, 
the right kind of person to appoint as a federal judge. And obviously it was going to have to be a white man in, in you know, 1901, 1902. And so, and he does that. He appoints the person that Bertie Washington suggests. And, uh, and so there's, you know, so Roosevelt is a, a, you know, has some redeeming dimensions in all of this. And he believes that he uh, is a supporter of, of African Americans. By the end of his time as president, that's all changed. He actually becomes a very damaging figure for African Americans. Uh, but at the beginning of it, it's, it's very different. And in, and in 1903, uh, this, through a sequence of events, it develops that there are some reports of this ongoing kind of new slavery that's beginning to happen, and that is happening on a huge scale all over the South. Well, some reports of that begin to filter into Washington, and, uh, and U.S. attorneys, the federal prosecutors out in the, you know, out, out in the states uh, are encouraged to investigate this and to bring cases uh, against people if they're actually engaged in slavery. Uh, now, there was one big problem with doing that, and that was that slavery was, in fact, not a crime. And, uh, and if you watched uh, the documentary 13, or the documentary based on my book, there's a lot of discussion of that. The 13th Amendment made slavery unconstitutional but it didn't, just like the, um, the whichever amendment it was that uh, gave us prohibition, uh, but the prohibition amendment <coughs> uh, said that, you know, that the, the production and sale of alcoholic beverages you know, was no longer legal in, in the United States. That's the, in what's in the amendment. But then there was an enabling law, an enabling statute that Congress passed that went with that, that said, and here are the statutes that, are, that will that will make this amendment real. And here's what the penalty is for if you, if you make alcohol or you sell it, and you know, here's how a pepsi works. And, the, and so the criminal statutes that were necessary to enforce this new amendment were adopted, and that's how prohibition worked. But with the 13th Amendment, which makes slavery unconstitutional except as punishment for a crime, that's the big exception in the 13th Amendment, but there also is never an enabling statute. Congress never passes a law that says, but if you do this, here's what's going to happen to you. And so there's no statute on the books until, very, until, until 75 years later. Uh, there's no statute passed that actually makes it a specific crime uh, to, to, to hold someone as a slave. And so, the, but so these investigations began in 1903, uh, and they all fall apart, ultimately, uh, because of this flaw in the law, for the most part. But word goes out. Uh, among African Americans, that this terrible thing has been happening. This whole situation has been declining. You know, the, after by 1901, there are no black, no black people are able to vote in rural counties of the South anywhere. You know, there's still some voting going on in the cities, but nobody in the countryside can vote anymore, or virtually no one can vote anymore. So African Americans are very aware that their world is falling apart uh, and the freedom that had existed uh, a decade or two earlier is vanishing. But they begin hearing about that there's some of these investigations going on uh, into this mistreatment of people and the people being kidnapped and sold into slavery. And, and there's this last little flash of possibility that maybe, you know, maybe, maybe things are going to be fixed. And so in the midst of all that, in July of 1903, a letter arrives at the White House. And I'll, I'll, this is very brief. But uh, it's from a woman named Carrie Kinsey. She lived in Bainbridge, Georgia, out you know, or on the edge of Bainbridge, Georgia. And she's writing the letter, writing to the letters addressed directly to the president at the White House. <coughs> and it's one piece of paper front and back. And uh, uh, she's someone who has learned to read and write. But you can see as you try to read the letter, she's struggling to, you know, to get it all down uh, uh, on this piece of paper. And what she writes to tell is the story of how her 14-year-old brother, whose name is James Robinson, but how her brother had been kidnapped a year earlier, had been kidnapped, and she knew the name of the person who had taken him, uh, had kidnapped him and had sold him uh, to this plantation uh, in the next county over. And she knew where he was, and based on what was in the letter, you could tell it, it read, at, give the impression that she'd probably been there and seeing him there, so she knew exactly. She knew the conditions that he was that he was being worked under, uh, and she had clearly been to every person in her world who had any kind of power. Uh, she'd been to see the sheriff. She'd been to see the postmaster, because that was actually a, an influential person in that time. But she'd been to all the people who might be able to help, and no one had 
has, had, has registered any concern. And so finally she sits down, she's heard about these investigations, and she writes a letter to the President of the United States. I think about that for just a minute. Uh, you know, you were, your 14 year old child or sibling, you know, has been kidnapped, and you know where they're being held, where they've been held for a year, you know they're being brutalized there, you know who took them, you know, you know, you know there's no mystery, you know all these things. And you've gone to tell, you've reported it to everybody you can come up with, and nobody cares. And nobody will do anything. And so you reach a point of desperation so great that you write a blind letter to the President of the United States. That's the only thing you can come up with, you know, to, 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 it's the last resort. When I found that letter in the National Archives, where I, was, I went through about 30,000 pages of, of material in the National Archives, that were those kinds of letters, you know, 30,000 pages of those from that period of time. And what she wrote, she wrote, Mr. President, and there's more to it than this, but she, they won't let me have him. He has not done nothing for them to have him in chains, so I write to you for your help. And that letter arrived at the White House, and a clerk there uh, logged it into a record book that the letter arrived, and then forwarded it over to the Department of Justice because it was a criminal allegation, or seemed to be. At the Department of Justice, they put it in a little envelope, a little rectangular envelope, uh, with a tag on it. They gave it a, a number, one two zero zero seven. So you know, a tracking number was put on it, and then that was filed into the system, and then nothing else ever happened. That was it. And the and so a a version of America had reemerged in the 20th century. You know, uh, it emerged in the 20th century in which not just African Americans were having a hard time, not just the black people weren't being allowed to exercise their political rights, but it was a version of America in which the kidnap and sale of a child was neither viewed as a criminal act or even a remarkable event. You know, that was the America that had come to exist. Uh, and, the, and that's the legacy uh, that we confront today is the, and that's the last observation I'll say about that. It's just that the, I remind students of this sometimes. If you just, yeah, I don't know what happened to James Robinson. I couldn't track him down. Uh, I think he finally got out of that particular place. I could, I could never conclusively figure out what happened to him. But when you look at all of the thousands and thousands and thousands of people who had things like that happen to them, you know, how many Barack Obamas, you know, were were in among those people, you know. How many should have been doctors, how many should have been lawyers, you know. Uh, and we're, for my families, you know, for the people that I descend from who are poor and illiterate and destitute, and I have a great grandmother who starved to death in the 1920s, I and mean, I've, I've got, i got lots of, lots of trashy white people stories I can tell, you know, uh, and uh, nobody can out, out bat me uh, in terms of family stories. But the system did everything in its power between 1900 and the 1950s to elevate my people, you know, to create opportunities that if they worked really hard and if they did go to school and if they you know, did do the things they were supposed to, uh, then electricity came to them and running water came to them and the possibilities came to them. Their schools got a lot better. Uh, they, they could, they ended, so my mom and dad finally went to college, you know, all those things. And so on that side of the equation, America did an incredibly good job of elevating this huge population of poor people and unleashing unbelievable amounts of talent and capacity that then had all sorts of other incredible benefits to the society. And when you think about not just the injuries that were done to specific black people or specific families, but the injuries that were done to the country and to, you know, to the society, the injuries it did to itself by suppressing all of the talent and ambition and capacity that remained invisible uh, in a system like that, then you realize that it's a huge part of the explanation uh, for what today still must be repaired uh, through reparations or, or uh, whatever means. But I appreciate you letting me tell you these depressing stories and I look forward to any thoughts that anybody has. So thank you very much.
Thanks again, Dr. Blackman. You, 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 can, you can sit over here until the oh, okay. Let us take just a two minutes to stretch and, and, uh, and just commune while we set up for the next presentation. Thank you. Okay, well, I guess we can get started. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, morning. It's so good to be back. Um, so today, the title of my presentation is Emotion and um, So in the summer of uh, 2015, I came here as a public health ethics fellow. Um, and I would talk to Dr. Warren like maybe every week. It was very often. And we would discuss ways in which we could improve our health. And, uh, you know, it just seemed like whatever we did, it just wouldn't work. Um, so he gave me a book, uh, it was called Optimal Health, uh, Dr. John Chazelle, uh, which he described these five components as our guide to better health. And as we look at these five components, um, the one component that really sticks out to me in my journey is emotional health. And I picked that because it seems as if we're going through a lot of stuff in our society right now. Um, it seems like it's always something new every day. Something new happening. So you have to keep your mind uh, at its greatest peace, I should say. And sometimes that can be very difficult. Um, uh, so as a student and a researcher, uh, you know, I do research focused on basically how systems work to oppress us, right? And the common theme that I find every time I try and research a system is it has some component of slavery. Mm -hmm. Every system in the world, mm -hmm. education, it doesn't matter what institution, you know, you talk about. And so we had slavery, then we had Jim Crow, now we have mass incarceration. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody knows how this goes. Dr. Blackman just talked about it. Eloquently at that. Um, so every day when I used to go to school, like when I was around seven, I used to walk to school. Uh, it was like me and like five of my boys, we were, you know, six or seven, first and second grade. And a common image that I still have is people that I knew from my neighborhood, uh, up against cop cars. And at that age, you really didn't know why. You just saw me, you know, you just saw the handcuffs, you just saw the flashing lights. It just kind of happened all the time. So it's just like, well, I wonder what, I just kind of wonder what kind of happened with that. But I'm going to the playground now, you know. And it's interesting because, what, I say, during my undergrad year, I caught my own case. So, looking back, it's just like, wow. Um, so, with my case, I really, I couldn't fight the case. Uh, I didn't have any funds for fees. Uh, I couldn't pay for a lawyer. Um, so, basically, they give you a public defender, and what they do is basically tell you to take the plea deal. Right. Uh, and then it's just like, it's over with. 
And I was on, I served probation for about three years. Um, so, actually after my first year on probation, I got accepted into Morehouse School of Medicine. And I caught the case in Alabama. So, uh, sometimes bi-weekly, sometimes every month, I would have to go see my PO. Drive like three hours back, you know, back to the hospital out of them. And jail is bad, right? Jail is, jail is horrible. But being on probation is horrible too. Um, just the way they treat you in the office, the drug tests, you know, you gotta use the bathroom right next to the person. You know, I mean, there's just all types of stuff, you know. Yeah. And it's just like, well, I'm getting my master's, but I don't care about that. They don't care about that at all, so. That was a, uh, that was something that I had to kind of go through, so that was tough. Um, so, you know, we kind of know that growing up, the system is not for us. Uh, really, at that age, like in high school, there's really nothing you could, it felt like there was nothing you could do about it. Um, uh, the only thing we really focused on was getting money, really. That was our only focus. We never care about school. The teachers didn't really uh, invest in us like that. We didn't really care too much about us. It seemed like um, so we just wanted to play sports and get some money. Um, now we had to, like you know we had to survive by any means necessary. You know that's just kind of how we felt at that time. And now since I'm older, hindsight is twenty twenty. So I'm like, well, it's a lot of things I would have done differently. But at that time, I felt like I was doing the right thing in my circumstance. So, you know. Um, so now what we see, I'm pretty sure these pictures are familiar to everybody in this room, uh, is the continuation of police murders. Uh, doesn't matter if it's on the camera or not, you know, you can pull out your phone, you can pull out your camera if you want to, but let's still shoot you down on the camera. Uh, you can put your hands up and say, you know, I don't have a gun, but somehow, some way, you're shot, killed. I know um, on our last, so in the last two months, my fiance and I, She's pregnant, by the way. Uh, we... <laughs> so we've been stopped probably probably like uh, twice in the last month or so. And when they pull you over, they always give you some reason as to why they put you over, and most of the time it's just bogus. Like I know the last two times was because they couldn't read her license plate or something like that. So, you know, they pull you over and you do everything that they ask you to do, right? show your hands and all of that. But then, you know, you make eye contact with them. And then, you know, they kind of look at you. And you already know what's coming next. So please step out the car. <laughs> so you step out the car, right? Then he tells you he's with some task force, you know, and we got to stop cars because people are coming in with all these drugs from here and there. I'm like, okay, you know, all right. So what am I doing here? You know what I'm saying? Like, let me go. So then he asked you all these questions. Sir, do you have crack? Sir, do you have weed? Any hair on? I'm like, sir, I'm like, what's going on? So then, you know, they get her out the car, knowing she's pregnant. And on this particular day, it was dark. It was cold. And, you know, she can't be in the cold for too long because she gets kind of nauseous, so she wants to throw up and all that stuff. 
So, you know, they just put you through all this unnecessary stuff. So, you know, this stuff is still going on. So these are some challenges that I constantly go through. Um, but when you don't put your emotions in the right place, whenever you don't check your fear and anger, they can find a way to see by the ways that you don't want them to. And uh, here on the first bullet, killing and harming one another. Uh, we've had a lot of violence to our own. Uh, just very recently, we lost a social activist. Well, he's a racist, but I call him a social activist. But he was killed in California by his own. He was shot three times. I mean, they have a video online and everything. Um, just very terrible, but it's because of this. Um, then for the second bullet, what we have, and I see all the time uh, being on social media, is people, their self-value is so tied, like it's, it's too closely tied to money. So if they don't have any money, they're not really worth anything. So like they'll do anything, sell their soul, just to get some money. And it's crazy because at a time when I was younger, that's how we thought. Because it's just those circumstances that you come in. Because the system preys on you. So if you're not careful, you will find yourself here. Um, and the third bullet, distress. Uh, now Dr. John Chazelle says that stress is vital for the advancement, but distress doesn't do you any good. Um, and as a result, you have poor health. Poor health outcomes are all across the board. Um, any health outcome you can think of, distress will take you down right through there. Um, <clears throat> so what I do is, uh, I know that it's important to believe in a higher power and for many people that's a different person, whoever that is for you, it's important that you keep that in your life because that's the only way you're going to get through these times. And that's the only way um, you're going to get the healthy outcomes that you see. Thank you. Given all the work that 
I've done. It was very surreal, but it's hard to put it into words because it's like an eerie feeling. Um, so yeah. And I, I have not been to the either of the new museums yet, but um, but Brian Stevens and I have done a, a fair bit of work together. In fact, he uh, filed a lawsuit. I like to claim him as my lawyer um, because he filed a lawsuit against the state of Alabama. Uh, when the state prison system banned my book from the, it wouldn't allow it to be sent to prisoners in the system, which the state of Kentucky also did, I think. Um, and Brian filed a lawsuit against the state of Alabama, and they and they reversed that. And so he and I have, uh, have have done a lot of things together since then. So I'm a big and I'm a huge fan of his work. I'm a huge fan of the concept of the museum. I though it, it, I don't have a good explanation for why I haven't been there. I think I'm actually sort of. Uh, anxious about actually seeing a museum for two reasons. One is the obvious one, I, you know, the, uh, just the reaction similar to yours. Um, but I also have a little bit of fear about that um, we are so, um, we actually have focused so much on the, on the homicides, you know, in the same way that we, we kind of love the Ku Klux Klan in a weird way because we all are agreed on that the Ku Klux Klan is totally evil. You know, we don't have to argue about that. And so we can talk a lot about the Klan and not, you know, and how terrible they are, and everybody's on the same page. It's sort of like Nazis, you know, they're supposed to be that way by Nazis. Um, the but the but that sort of, but but that also lets a lot of people off the hook if you just obsess on on the, the extreme things like the Ku Klux Klan. It lets the sheriff off the hook who you know did the things that I was talking about, who wasn't maybe part of the clan, or wasn't ever obvious. Or it lets my grandfather off the hook, who one of my grandfathers who participated in a mob attack on a black man in the 1930s, but the man was not killed. Uh, he, would, he ended up, I'm sure, being run out of the parish in Louisiana, so his life was wrecked. Um, but he's not on that list of lynchings because he didn't die that night. Um, and so I, a, I always have a little bit of fear of that, uh, that we can end up dwelling so much on, uh, on, on a certain set of incidents that we lose the, the ubiquity of, uh, uh, almost the banality of the oppression that, you know, that occurred in many other ways as well. about how if it is left just at black men, then what is that saying about black females? So meaning if perhaps you can respond to um, Talitha LaFlorian's book, where, as well as Sarah Haley's book, and also just sort of thinking about the dangers oftentimes of placing black males solely um, at the forefront of the discussion and then leaving black females. Like, where are we? And then also, Think of speaking about, because you talked about the archives and getting access. Perhaps this is a great space to talk about the racial politics of archives and, and how we are off Google. What does that look like? Um, and then also, is it, I can't kind of read your last name, I'm sorry. Kirksey. okay. Thank you um, as well for sharing your experience, because again, to give us the the personal, the lived experience, and also including your fiance and her unborn child, your, both of your unborn child, because again, we get this narrative in the news that, and then even honestly looking at the pictures of, they're always about men in prison. And then, you know, really sort of thinking about, if we're looking at Jill McCorpel's book, Breaking Women, looking, again, so I guess if both of you could sort of speak to that, and the gender dynamics as well as the archival, you know, Getting offline to get access. Yeah, sure. It's a it's a dilemma, and I don't mean in any way to diminish the yeah. the severity of the experience that uh, that African American women had in the historic the historical version of this. I'm talking about or or what happens today. It's a it's a, and Talitha's work is is fantastic. I've been a huge proponent of uh, of her. You know, she's in the documentary film that we made based on yeah. the book, and uh, and uh, and and so. 
but it is this it is this challenge of though that uh, the the impact of all of this on women also uh, in fact I would argue that it was even larger on women who were not uh, ever you know arrested and forced into these work camps it, there was an even larger impact on the you know on the wives and family members and spouses of the, in the same way that the abuses of the system today uh, you know for every African American man who is wrongly incarcerated or wrongly or incarcerated for longer than he should be, or you know any of those things, you know, there's a whole set of other people whose lives are also radically altered, and 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 that's and in fact that's the largest injury, you know that, that you know the, the if you could measure the injury somehow, you know that's where the measurements would get the biggest is with all the collateral uh, effect of it all. Uh, it is a little bit of a challenge in that, particularly when I was writing. Uh, that book, which is now, you know, I started on that almost 20 years ago, and the book was published more than 10 years ago. And some of the things that when I would say them 10 years ago, when I, you know, if I was talking to a group at a university, and I would say, yes, yeah, slavery re didn't really end at the end of the Civil War, and it was resurrected and continued in the 20th century, there'd be a lot of people in the room who would go, what? What are you talking about? You know, that's crazy. You know? um, now, if I say that, particularly in a university setting, all the young people go, yeah, what's the big deal? Of course, you know, we know that, you know. Um, and so our comprehension of these things, you know, has changed pretty rapidly. And uh, but when I was doing, writing that book ten years ago, um, I was very conscious of that. While we don't want to leave anybody out who deserves to be in the picture, we also can't. We can overbalance sometimes. And uh, and so in terms of the the direct arrest and imposition of this system on you know on individual human beings. It was numerically, mathematically, overwhelmingly men that this happened to. But it did also happen to a substantial number, you know, meaningful number of women with all sorts of terrible consequences. And so my answer in the end to all of this is that uh, there are many, many more books to be written, and some of them have been written in the last, you know, in the last 10 years. And, uh, and th other things that I've done also, I think, you know, will you know, circle back to some of these things. Uh, it all has to be part of the story. Uh, we also shouldn't uh, make the mistake of feeling like we have to declare everything to be 50-50, you know, because then it distorts the story. And, and I'm a big, uh, I'm a big proponent of, uh, well, I'm, a, I'm actually an optimistic person about the, that in the ultimately we need to really talk a lot about the future, but I also am a huge proponent of being very granular and very specific about the past and confronting every single detail of it uh, and uh, and particularly when I was writing that book that that was my uh, you know my intention and uh, and so it sorted out the way the other thing I will say that's missing from the book that bothers me more actually on this is just that the uh, the book is so depressing in so many ways and it's so grim you know what really happened and it doesn't capture as much as if I were re if I, if I were putting out another version of today uh, there's some. There are more places where I would focus more on some of the ways that African Americans resisted uh, what was happening. Um, now, again, it's one of these things where, in terms of the math of it, you know, it's a million incidents of uh, of where a terrible thing happens, and if there was resistance, it was it was crushed instantly. And versus that million, there's a thousand times that you know that there's resistance that you know that. That's sustained for some period of time or in some sort of way, and so there's again there's sort of okay, well I need to tell the story of the million, you know, more than the thousand because that's the bigger thing. But I do think that uh, if I were rewriting the book, it would be more of that and some more of the uh, of women. But I'm very, uh, I think it's fantastic that uh, and Talitha and others have shown and that there's Sarah more than I. Work on the other which I'm not as familiar with. Uh, Sarah um, Haley's No Mercy Here. Uh, I'm familiar with the book, but I'm not. I'm, I'm completely conversant with Talitha's work. I'm less conversant with with Haley's. Uh, but uh, uh, but I'm very glad that those things are you know that uh, that, that that work's being done. Uh, um, <clears throat> I think black women have it bad too. Um, their incarceration rates may not be quite as high as black males, but the disparity between black women and white women is still very large. Um, so that's obviously an issue. Uh, and for two, 
I think that um, we talk about how black males feel whenever they're encountered by a police officer. Well, I know personally that black women feel a similar way too, because uh, we've heard stories of them being killed and sexually assaulted by cops. I mean, these things happen all the time. Um, I didn't really hit on it because I was hitting from my personal perspective, but uh, it wasn't to discount what's going on. Um, I'm, I'm going to address Dr. Percy, and I'm calling you doctor because I know that you're going to get your PhD. <laughs> now, I think, did I, were you here last year? Yes, ma'am. And I spoke to you. you yes, we were you talking about the fact that you were kind of quiet last year. Yes, ma'am. But I spoke yeah. to you because I'm from Columbia, South Carolina. Yes, ma'am. And I think I gave you my phone number so that you got to keep <laughs> trouble with the call. <laughs> my name is Beverly Brooks. Yes, ma'am. What's um, like that? But what I want to say in reference to what you were talking about, they do target us. Because I was in Orlando, Florida, and I was driving. I have a muscle car. I have a red Dodge Charger. All right. The tent is more in the back than in the front. I was at a light. I was getting ready to pull off. And as I was getting ready to turn, this cop stopped me. He put his blue lights on. Now, <laughs> it was all middle-aged women in the car. It's me, myself, I mean myself, one of my girlfriends, another white girlfriend, and another black girlfriend. All of us middle-aged, we had been to the movies. And they were like, why is he pulling you over? We know you're not going too fast, because you drive kind of slow. I don't drive really slow. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I don't cause, I don't cause them to stop my car because I know that they target, my sister's a deputy sheriff in South Carolina. Okay. And she has told me, yes, they do target dark red cars. So he didn't have any reason as to why he pulled me over. When I rolled down the window and he got a look inside and he saw, now true, he, I had, my hair was longer and it was twisted. Okay. So he probably thought I was a male when he pulled me over. Okay, so he was trying to see, well, what's in that car, and I have a South Carolina license tag. Right. So he probably pulled me over thinking we were in there smoking reef or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. But when I rolled down that window, you could see the surprise on his face. And he couldn't tell us, he gave some bogus excuse as to why he pulled us over. Okay. <laughs> so I understand what you're talking about. Now, what I do want to say is I hope that didn't happen to you in Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> it happened, actually, we were on the way, well, the first time it happened on the way back from Atlanta going toward Aiken on 20. And then the second time it happened, we were coming back from Georgia Southern going towards Augusta. Okay. So I, I don't know what that highway was. You may not remember. Uh, highway 25. Okay, highway 25. So we got stopped in um, Warren County uh, the first time, and the second time it was uh, in Burke County. Okay. So both times it was in Georgia because I had a Mississippi license plate. Okay. Then my car, I drive a white Altima with a tent, so then they automatically tell me I have to remove my tent when I'm driving through Georgia. But sometimes I have to put it back on when I cross the state car. Right. But, but it's, it's important to share that information with people. And is there anything that you have done about it, the fact that you got pulled over and it was like you were targeted? Is there anything I've done? Um, not, not physically. Um, I just try to make sure I don't give them a reason to. Yeah. But it just seems like it's if it happens, it happens. I want to have all my paperwork. Right. Right. <laughs> what do you want? You know, the car thing and anything in it, you know, things like that. Um, because it seems like certain things you, it's really out of your control as far as that goes. Right. Because there's always something. It's right. always a loophole. I understand. And Dr. Blackman, thank you so much for your talk because I've learned something. And I was talking to Ms. Head and she shared with me the name of the book.
So I will go and get that book because it really starts your mind to thinking about, you know, the fact that, you know, the slavery in, in another name. Yeah. So yes, thank you very much. Thank you. By the way, on, on your, very quickly, uh, I get asked a lot about more on the question you're asking. Uh, people often will say, well, what can I do? What should I do? You know, okay, this is terrible what happened. What can I do to fix things now? One thing I always say to people that people have kind of forgotten, um, but you know, the main incarcerator in our society is the sheriff. You know, that, you know, the sheriff runs, the, in almost all places, the sheriff runs the county jail, and that's where the vast, you know, largest numbers of people who get arrested go to the county jail. And so, and the district attorney is also is elected. The sheriff is almost always elected. Um, and and there used to be a tradition. I think when it was white people being abused, poor white people feel like they're being abused by the police. You know, in the 20s and 30s and 40s, there was some tradition of you know people kind of rising up and voting in a different sheriff. You know, the, in the, but that's kind of been lost. And I just remind people because most people look, don't pay attention to they don't even notice who's running for sheriff. They may not know the name of the sheriff in their own county. And, but that is a very real thing that you can do. Uh, and if, if a bunch of people start getting the word to, you know, to a candidate for sheriff or the sitting sheriff that they're mad about some things that have been happening, then it can have an effect. You know, it, and it's you know, I, I, it, it's not the same thing as Jesus and Martin Luther King um, uh, coming and fixing everything all at once. Um, uh, but it's a, it's a way of changing the temperature in the room a little bit at the time you live in. Uh, my name is Leo Ware, and I got, not a question, but kind of make a statement. Born in the area of 1938, I can relate to a lot of the black there because I've heard, I've heard uh, you say something about the uh, laws that they made, and I reflect back to one and you probably read about it, they call it Reckless Eyeball. Yes. <laughs> and that was specific meant for black people, mm -hmm. or black men especially. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then you brought up another point about the Bo Weaver. <laughs> and then I went back to Bo Dilly. <laughs> <laughs> so something about the Bo Weaver. Okay? So that's what the point I want to make. And to the young gentleman there, I was caught up in 1960 coming through Georgia in the same situation you was in. I had my mother and my children and we was coming out of Florida, coming to Alabama. I was pulled over in Cusper, Georgia, I know where to get it, and I was coming down a small hill, the speed limit was probably 50 or 55, but I'm coming down the hill and I saw the car behind me. I didn't put the brake lights up to slow down, I just kept my speed and let it coast down. He pulled me over, told me I was speeding, at that time, there wasn't no such thing as writing a ticket to go, you know, to come back or send a fine. You had to go or pull this judge then. This was at night. And he was there. The judge was there. He took you in, and he told you what you've done. You paid your fine. I and the judge and him was the only one in there. And that, I laid up on the desk. I never would forget it. God knows. I wanted to do something so bad. He kicked me and told me, stand up nigga, okay? I wanted so bad to do something. But being scared and knowing what had happened to other people, or other in cases like mine to resist it, I just took it with a smile. And I told him I gotta go back to the car and get the money where I can come back to pay. I had the money in my pocket, so I wanted to come out and let mom and, and my church know what was going on. So I told him what was going on. I said, I'm going back and pay the $40. He let me uh, pay the forty dollars, and we're talking about no receipt now. Okay, I don't know what happened to that money. I just come on out and got in my family, and I thought about it. Were no motels for my family to stay in if they put me to jail, and I don't know where they had my child, and my family would have been out there standing waiting on me. So I had to use sense and common judgment to get out of it. And when I explained to other kids about that, they tell me the same thing. Oh, I would have took that. I would have done that. And that's the point I want to make. And thank you so much for sharing. Thanks, Mark. That's wonderful. Uh, good morning. I'm over here. I'm the husband of a descendant, and I want to thank both of you. Uh, Beverly has a big mouth. I was going to be the first to call you out the curtain. <laughs> thank you. 
Uh, and, and, and I, I too, uh, had, had a similar instance. All I think it was about maybe 40 years ago, and we had cloth diapers. And we had a diaper pail in the car. And the guy decided he wanted to search the car. I told him there was a diaper day. He had, he had to see for himself. Took the top off that diaper pail, and oh my God. <laughs> He let me go. <laughs> uh, Dr. Michael, I, I mentioned to you, I, I'm from Jefferson County. I know about those steel mills, and I know about uh, those, those men. My father worked in the steel mill. I saw your book about eight years ago. I, if I had known you were here, I would have uh, revisited that book. And because uh, there were some questions that I had. And uh, as a, I listened to the descendants. And the thing is, healing from those things that were, were done to them. I don't know whether you ran into that. I'm sure in your research you, you mentioned, I think, that you had some problems with people who were ashamed uh, of what had happened to them because they were victims. Uh, we as descendants talk, and we do, I'm glad we have healing sessions. Matter of fact, on Monday, I think we sort of hijacked the session and took it in a different direction. And uh, Dr. Wendell was willing to do that. And, I, and so I, I would like to you, not you, the victims. How, how do you? How, how did they feel about this? I, you, you mentioned the shame, and I thought about Steinbeck and travel with Charlie, where he, he ran into a situation like that. Well, I, I ran into the whole you know, spectrum of things. You know, there uh, there's some people who uh, know something about what happened to an ancestor of theirs, and they want to know more about it, and they. Uh, and they feel outraged about it, and it's a source of strength to them to you know to know that story and to be able to fill in the gap and and to react to it. There are other people who you and I were talking about, like in the epilogue of the book, uh, uh, I describe a, an exchange I had with a descendant of, of the main character or a relative of the main character in the book, and uh, and he uh, you know he was an elderly gentleman at the time. I'm sure passed away now, but uh, who you know just did, did not want to talk about you know, any of this uh, and. Uh, just too painful, and he was also somebody who I think had, you know, I think there are people in the room who will understand this uh, more than younger people, but, you know, there was a long period of time where, for an African-American family, particularly in the rural South, um, it was arguably unwise to talk about the bad things that had happened to the young people in your family, because you might well, you know, that might well encourage them to, to want to do something that was going to then cause, you know, cause them greater difficulty. And so, in some families, there was a real, you know, a real, uh, you know, kind of deliberate silence about these things. But and also some shame, some humiliation that people didn't want to talk about after we live. And, uh, and so, there are a lot of different, you know, ways that these things are processed. Um, I, you know, my view is that uh, obviously nobody ought to have to talk about things they don't want to talk about. But, but the, uh, I think that we all benefit greatly from the. You know, from the ventilating of, of all of this. And, and with the passage of time, it is a lot easier to, for some people to talk about things that once were difficult. Um, I also say to white people that the, because uh, I've encountered a whole lot of people who are the descendants of, you know, that, that's what, in some respects, even more remarkable to me is to come to an event like this uh, and somebody, you know, an older white person, come to me afterwards and say, well, you know, I'm actually the, you know, the whatever of, you know, that guy who did that terrible thing, you know, some bad white character, some oppressor. And I've, I've, the first time that happened to me in Alabama, the person came up to me at an event at 16th Street uh, Baptist Church, uh, which was this bizarre thing to me to actually, you know, be the speaker at 16th Street Baptist Church. And, uh, but then afterwards, this white man comes up to me. Uh, and says, well, you know, I'm the grandson of this really terrible figure uh, in the book who'd done these terrible things. But then he went on to explain that he was on the board of the Civil Rights Institute in, in Birmingham, you know, that he'd become a minister and, you know, you know obviously led a radically different life than the one that, uh, that his ancestors had done. But, but what I say to people, uh, and that's the same way I feel about my family, the thing I said about my grandfather just a second ago, is that, you know, being honest about bad things that were done in the past, you know, uh, it doesn't doesn't mean that I can't love my grandfather. The fact that my grandfather uh, what got caught up in a horrible, violent melee when he was 16 years old and did something that I think he actually was ashamed of for the rest of his life, um, you know, I, I I do want to know that, you know, and it doesn't then take away that I also loved him, you know. 
and the and the fact that I, that humiliating things happen to people. Uh, I think ultimately we can talk about these things and we benefit from it. And acknowledging the complexity of human life, which is that we all do bad things and we all do good things. Hopefully, we do more good things than bad. Um, but that's the nature of human life, uh, and. I think it helps, you know, to acknowledge all that, on whichever side of the equation people may be. Uh, but there are a lot of different reactions. We are fully out of time, and it's fitting that the person who would have asked the question, this is Dr. Carruthers, because she is in fact up next, so you can put your question in your time frame. So let's give a hand up right now for Dr. Carruthers, and we welcome Dr. Warren. Thank you.